Old Testament, they were believers in Jehovah or Yahweh. You write this down, you notes. In the Old Testament, there were believers in Jehovah or Yahweh and were servants of God. In the Old Testament, there were believers in Jehovah or Yahweh, you can write just like Jehovah, J-E-H-O-V-A-H. -H. Jehovah, they were, they were believers in Jehovah and were servants and were called servants of God. The call servants of God. Now, what do servants do? Servants, what is, what, what, what is the value of a servant? I, I normally, let me wipe this and I write it down. I normally, I normally talk about this. Oof, this is not good. This is not good. I gotta take this one and wipe it so we can have it better. The value of a servant, while I'm wiping this, the value of a servant is in their service. The value of a servant, if I don't touch that thing, please, leave it alone. You are kind of messing with Leave it, just leave it. Leave it. It's okay. As long as the bars are there, leave it alone. Don't worry. I'll give you all the spot. The value of the servant is in their service. I'll explain to you why I'm saying that. The value of the servant is in their service. A servant is only worth their service. It's just like when people go to work, the reason why you go to work is because you have the skill set they need. If you don't have the skill set they need, they will not employ you. It's not about being handsome or being tall or being beautiful. It's about your service. The value of a servant is in your service. The value of a servant is in their service. So in the Old Testament, they were called servants of God. Why? And servants have to obey laws. Servants have to obey laws. That's, that's the Old Testament. Okay? They were believers in Yahweh. Okay, they were believers, but they were servants. They were believers, but they were servants. Okay? But now, in the New Testament, we are sons of God. In the empty New Testament, we are sons. Okay, sons, and we are, we are friends. We're sons and friends. We are sons and friends. In the New Testament, we are sons and friends. Sons have the nature of their father have sons have the nature of daddy sons have the nature of their father or daddy okay that's what sons are about so why in the old testament they were servants they had to obey laws in new testament we are sons and we have the nature of our father we're also called friends okay why are we called friends what's 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 friends Friends are people you enjoy their company, okay? Enjoy whose company you enjoy their company without the sense of judgment. Judgment. Okay, one, and also we can share secrets with. Share secrets with. Okay, now of course there are different levels of friendship. Okay, but friends are people you enjoy their company without a sense of judgment. Non judgmental. One of the reasons why some people don't have friends is because they're, they're too judgmental. So people come around them, they always feel what do I have to fix? And if anytime you have to come around someone and have to think you have to fix something, guess what? You, after a while, you will like that person's company. Okay? Friends are people who you enjoy their company with a sense of judgment and you can share secrets with or share things with. Now, I said there are different levels of friendship. So different levels of friendship will determine what you can share. But generally, friends are people you enjoy their company. You share common interests. 
Okay, and you enjoy their company. Okay? That's not talking about friends. Friends, share, common, interest. Okay? Now, let's, let's scratch on. So, look at, like I said, friends are people. In the Old Testament, they were servants. Servants have to obey laws. Mid Testament, we are sons. We have the nature of our father. But he also calls us friends. Because friends enjoy the comp are people who enjoy their company without sense of judgment. You share secrets or intimacy with. And also people who you share common interests with. Okay? Now, let's get some scriptures in on this. Look at John chapter 15, verse 15, and John 8, 35. John 8, 35. Let's start from John 8, 35 and John 15, 15. John 8, 35. John chapter 8, verse 35. This is what it says. Okay? This is Jesus speaking. So it's a red letter if you have a Makata Bible. It says here, The servant abided not in the house forever, but the son abided forever. If you have the NIV to say, the NIV will say, let me, let me read it from this one. Okay, here. Okay. It says, a, this is the New Living Translation. It says, a slave or a servant is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is a permanent member of the family. So the Old Testament it was always about laws, obeying laws. And when you have to obey laws, you don't enjoy, you just, okay, let me just, uh, let me just do it just to satisfy my boss. That's all about, that's, that's what it was all about in the Old Testament. There was no sense of intimacy, no sense of friendship. Now, look at John 15, verse 15. John 15, verse 15. It says that, this is Jesus speaking, Henceforth I call you not servants, or I don't call you slaves anymore. For servant knoweth not what the, his Lord doeth. I told you, you know what they do. They share common interests. They enjoy their company. Okay? It says, uh, where's it No, I know what this Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all the things I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Friends reveal things. I know I call, I know I call you servants, but, I, but, but because a master does not confide in his servants, this is a New Living Translation, but now you're my friends, since I've told you everything the Father has told me. Friends are people you share, you share things with, you share common interests, you enjoy their congresses of judgment. Now, why is this important? Listen very carefully. Don't forget, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit in, in, okay? This is very important because in the Old Testament, God's people could not enjoy God's company because of sin, okay? They could not enjoy God's company because of sin. They were not God's friends. That's why in the Old Testament, what would God, what did God say? God said, Moses, take off the shoes from where you're from, from, from where you're standing. Take off your shoes where you're standing. For his holy ground. In the Old Testament, high priest goes into the Holy of Holies. He has not purified himself, but what does he do? Bam! He drops dead. Because in the Old Testament, the value of their relationship with God was based on servitude, based on obeying laws. So they did not obey the laws, they were not valuable anymore. Okay? They were valuable, but they were not valuable in the sense of what God wanted them to do. But they're valuable as God's creation. Yes, they were. But in the New Testament, God says, you are not my servant. And this, this, this is very interesting. Listen very carefully. This is the gift God gave us. God gave us the gift of friendship already. <laughs> God said, you are my friend already. How do I know? Jesus was baptized. Okay, he came out from the water of baptism and God said, This is my beloved son. I'm pleased with him. He had not done any miracle, not done anything, but God gave him the gift of friendship already. He says, You are my beloved. I'm pleased with you. I'm thrilled about you. This is a gift that God gave Jesus when he got baptized. And baptism is like our salvation experience. So it's like when a person gets born again, God literally says, I'm giving you the gift of friendship from the beginning. So you don't have to obey God to be God's friend. You don't have to obey God to be God's friend. Because you are born again, because you are a child of God, God promotes you to friendship. 
God starts you off from the from the from jump street, like they say, with friendship. Okay, let's start some more. I'm about to just wrap this up. Now, so we established that in the Old Testament and New Testament are different. Now, so what makes us distinct? What where is this God in us then? Where is it? Now, let me say this: that God already spoke about this, that God will be in us. God already prophesied, spoke about it before. In Ezekiel 36, 27, write it down. Ezekiel 36, 27. Ezekiel 11, 19. Ezekiel 36, 27. Okay. God prophesied about God in us in before Christ before before Christ okay Ezekiel 36 verse 27 and Ezekiel 11 19 God already spoke about this God there was already prophecy God spoke about it before time God prophesied about God being in us not just with us not just being for us, not just being with us, for us or upon us, but God being in us. He already prophesied before Christ. Look, so let's look at those scriptures. Ezekiel 26, verse 27, 27, and it's 36, 27, and Ezekiel 11, 19. Ezekiel, I'm going to read 11. I got this 11, 19. Ezekiel 11. Verse 19. Here's what it says. It says, And I will give them one heart, and I'll put a new spirit within you, and I'll take your stony heart from your flesh, and I'll give them a heart of flesh. Okay? It says, I'll, put, I'll take you away, I'll give them one heart, I'll put a new spirit within you. By the time before, we were dead in our sins and trespasses. We, were, we had a dead spirit before. So he said, I will take away that old one, I'll put a new one inside there. That's what he said, I'll take away stony, stony heart from their flesh, and I'll put a new heart of flesh in them. Why? What's a heart of flesh? A heart that is sensitive. Stone has no sensitivity, flesh does. A heart that responds to God. We're dead in our sins, we're unresponsive. We didn't have the nature to respond. But now he says, I'm going to put a heart within them. The heart is about the nature, the center, the core of the thing. Now, Ezekiel 36, verse 27. Ezekiel 36, verse 27. Let me speak 26 and 27. It says that a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. Look at verse 27. And I'll put my spirit within you. Within. Notice that I told you we're talking about God prophesying about God in us. So I put my spirit, my spirit, not just this, but my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes. I shall keep my judgments and do them. I put my spirit where within you. He notice he said, I will, in a futuristic tense, just before Christ. Okay. Even Jesus said the same. Look at John. Look at Jesus speaking about this same thing. John chapter four, chapter fourteen, verses sixteen through seventeen. Jesus spoke about it. Spoke about it in, in John, John 14, 16, and 17. So let's go there. Jesus spoke about this directly, specifically. Spoke about it in John 14, 16 and 17. It says there, and I'll pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter. I will abide with you forever. Look, he uses the word with there. Okay? What's the problem? Go, 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 please go. Jesus Christ. I pray the Father. Put that thing, put that thing. Is it alright? Come on. Put put the trash can. Put the trash can the whole Go, go, please go. Goodness. 
So Jesus spoke about this in John chapter 14. So let's go verse, from verse 16 through 17. He said, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you. This is the word with them. With the way used to it. They only knew about with. Okay? Forever. It says, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it's yet him not, neither knowing him. But it says, but you know him, for he dwelt with you. And look at this. And shall be where? In you. In you shall be in you. So write this down. The indwelling of the Holy, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the hallmark of the New Testament. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the hallmark of the New Testament. I'm putting it down this way. The indwelling, indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the hallmark, hallmark of the New Testament. Okay, that's what makes the New Testament distinct from the Old Testament. One thing, one of the major distinctions is that the Holy Spirit isn't the believer. Now, one of my right scripture, Romans 8, 9, one of my favorite scriptures. One of my favorite scriptures. Because he's in us, anyone that does not have the Spirit of Christ is not, is not of his. Okay, Romans 8, 9, it says it clearly. Anyone that does not have the Spirit of God is not of his, not of Christ, not of his. So he's in us. Okay? That is what happens when, happens when anyone gets born again. Holy Spirit comes to live within the person. When you get born, he comes to live within the person. Now, let's write down the scriptures. Write down 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. And also John chapter 20. We're going from verse 18 to 23. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. 2 Corinthians 6, 16, John 20, from verse 18 to 23. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, okay. It says that 2 Corinthians 6, 16, it says that we're really, uh, what and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. I'll dwell in them, I'll walk in them, I'll dwell in them, I'll walk in them. The word walk there means to live, to live through, like walking. It doesn't mean that God's going to walk inside all over the place. No. But live through you. That's what it's saying. I will dwell. In the, the word dwell means to make somewhere your home. So what does that mean? When you get born again, Jesus lives in you. In the person of the Holy Spirit. When you get born again, he lives in you. You are his dwelling. His permanent address. In the Old Testament, I told you, the king, the priest, the prophet, and seven people. The Spirit of God will come upon them for service. Okay? But us in the New Testament, he dwells in us permanently. I will dwell in them. And he said, Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit, he will be in you forever. He will be in you. He's with you, but he will be in you forever. So you got born again, you are God's permanent address. Now, how when did the Holy Spirit come in the believers? When did he come? Look at John 20. John to the 20. When did he come? Like some people said, the Pentecost. When they spoke in tongues. No. That was upon them. That was upon them. We're going to teach that in a different class. We're talking about in them now. Okay? John 20. Let me start from verse, verse 18. Actually, let me start from verse 19. Then the same evening, the same day at evening, being the first of the week, when the doors were shut, <clears throat> when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. 20. Excuse me. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. They were, uh, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord.